Welcome to the Illini Enquirer podcast. It's your favorite time of week. Let's talk some football with Jay Lehman, Illini, All-American linebacker, and our analyst here at Illini Enquirer. Jay, we've had some close games. I think this was closer than most people uh, expected, but it's just the way it all ended, 20-17 to 17 with a seven-point lead with five minutes left and finding a way to lose in regulation. It's just heartbreaking. It's brutal. Um, but af- after sitting on this one for a couple of days, it didn't feel any better, right? Because you had a chance to win this game, even though there was there were signs of progress, especially for the defensive side of the ball, at least. Right, right. No, I mean, I think we got to – so let's just zoom out for a second. We're going to spend four games. We played a week zero game. Um, the three home games have been very competitive games. Uh, we've come up short on two of the three. Um, and probably against the opponent we thought we wouldn't beat, we, we beat um, in Nebraska. Uh, but they've all come down to the fourth, um, you know, last minutes of the fourth quarter. And we've all had seasons where we just wish for a half of competitiveness. Um, we'll, we, we, we might get into that in October, November, because that's, that's, that's some of those games get a little bit tougher. But um, I, I think that there, there's two critical moments. There's a lot of critical moments in the game. I don't think uh, Dan Enos called a good game as an offensive coordinator for Maryland. I thought was actually thoroughly out coached uh, by Ryan Walters. Um, I know Loxley is not calling the plays right now. I don't think I think he has some, some, um, um, you know, some, some say in it, but um, I think if we, if we just zone in, um, you know, the critical drives and critical decisions are obviously that, that third and two, fourth and two uh, at the 42 yard line, we're just maybe on the brink of James McCourt, making a two possession game. Uh, we're on the brink of, if we get on the first down, uh, you know, for every first down you get, uh, if no timeout is called, you can run off two minutes and 20 seconds. So there's a 40 second play clock. Each play is going to last about seven seconds. So, you know, it's at five minutes. It gets it all the way down to two minutes and 40 seconds. If they don't use any of their three timeouts, they probably would have used a timeout, but we probably would have been closer to kick a field goal as well. So that was a big decision. And I'm not, Bad mouth and beat him because up until that point, his defense had played really well. So let's let we got Blake Hayes, let's use him. Um, and then of course, we shoot ourselves in the foot on our last drive just horribly. And it reminded me of the drive in the third quarter where we shot ourselves in the foot with penalties and sacks and flipped the field again. Uh, but I do think uh Badinovich, uh had a bogus holding call. Uh, I don't think that was a holding. And that was a big run by McCray uh, that he got banged up on. And so there's a lot of plays that could have changed the game, right? And those are just the ones that hit me. Long story short, though, um, I do want to talk more about the defense uh, yeah. and a lot of different other things, but I don't want to just give, you know, all the stuff in one question. I have a tendency to do that. Yeah, well, here's the thing. I, I think you we talked before this, and we kind of want to hit on some of the same things. And it's quarterback. It's uh, competitiveness on defense. Um, some issues at, at wide receiver on this team. Um, but let's talk about a positive here. And in the over under for this game, Jay, was 61, right? Because everyone thought Maryland was going to go for 35 plus. I mean, I did too. I, I thought at Maryland would score 38 in this game. They hold them to 20 points. And despite a bad five final five minutes for everybody on the team, but including the defense, um, what, what changed? Like, what did Ryan Walters do schematically? What was different with the players to be able to go two of 10 on third down? I mean, they got off the field. They forced turnovers and big moments. Uh, what, what was different? So first and foremost, the biggest schematic change that he did was he, he rushed three a lot and dropped eight and said, we're going to keep the ball in front of us, play with our eyes, seeing the football. Now in man coverage, your eyes are on your man. You're not able to see the football as much because you're watching your man. And uh, we had run a, a good portion of man coverage. Uh, but they said, we're going to do rush three and drop eight. And it worked. And, and not only did it work in as far as making them complete passes and longer drives where they're going to self-destruct over eight to 10 plays, which they did with some penalties and some turnovers. But actually, ironically, our pass rush was better with three guys did not. And, and hats off to Johnny Newton, who I think is going to be a good player. Well, we actually got some really good young players. Um, not so much in the junior area, junior class, but I tell you what, there's some freshmen and sophomores that, that they, they could be good. 
uh, I, I think actually the reason they were able to do that is we have the three man rush. You have more freedom as far as what your rush lanes are. It's basically like guys get to the quarterback somehow, you know, and they play better that way rather than just, you know, s- some of the other four or five man rushes they had. And then I thought they did a good job for the most part rallying to tackle with guys in space up front. You know, Witherspoon got burnt a little bit, taking some gambles, but man, he always comes up and has physical tackles. So I like the way he played. Um, for the most part, they made uh, Talia Tonga for the first three quarters throw into relatively tight windows. And there was a couple shots that Talia just missed, uh, you know, the corner of the end zone and whatnot. So I just thought it was an improvement schematically. I thought Maryland obviously did their best when they got that first first down of a series and then they hurried up their offense and basically ran the same play either zone or the slant which is the rpo run pass option and you'd see it like they're in the, the same play three or four times in a row either zone slant or that dig route across the middle uh, to one of their big receivers five six or seven uh, Jarrett jones or, or demas and they go down like the field like a minute and that's when they would get going they didn't do that enough though and they did not um You know, they just didn't execute the way they should have. And I thought Ryan Walters' defense improved. And hats off to Ryan Walters for doing something he probably doesn't want to do in dropping eight and playing zone. He probably wants to play more man. But say, hey, I got to do this. I thought thought Ryan Walters thoroughly outcoached the Maryland offensive coordinator. I've been really impressed by him. I know they've struggled here early on, Jay, but just talking to him and and the adjustments he makes and then – some big personnel decisions to sit two super seniors and Tony Adams and uh, Isaiah Gay for Seth Coleman, who we, we talked about, can anybody create havoc? That That's the guy. And then Taz Nicholson, I thought was solid. Um, yeah. you know, like what, what do you think those personnel moves did for Illinois? And, and, that, and that does show a coach who's going to adjust. Well, number one, it shows just because I'm a super senior doesn't guarantee that I'm going to play. Uh, it just doesn't, uh, you know, I think Nicholson had his moments, but Taz, for the most part, was in position a lot. I got to give him credit for that. Seth Coleman obviously had the play of the game, uh, negated much by the interception right after it. But, you know, great challenge by Bielema there. Great job of the defense, letting people know, hey, he did strip the ball. But I thought Coleman played well. I, I think, there, you know, Zeke Holmes actually shows some flashes every once in a while. Uh, 33, right? Yep. Um, like they have some, they have some flat. Johnny Newton, I think, is going to be a really good football player. He's got some special flashes, doesn't? I mean, it's got to be consistent. But there's, yeah, he's a, big and athletic. Right. When Calvin Avery plays hard, he compresses the co- the pocket. You just probably get two or three plays, and then it's, he gets gassed. It seems like so. Um, yeah, I, I, so that he makes personal decisions, I think it's good. That he makes the adjustments, I think it's, I think it's good. Um, this is a team. I know they played Howard. I know they they played a West Virginia team that just beat Virginia Tech. Maryland did, and put up thirty five on them. And um, you know, I, I I thought Talia would have been. I mean, he was accurate, but they, they they were able to subdue a very potent offense. And we talk about this the last two or three weeks. We felt like our defense didn't keep us in the game. Well, they definitely kept, and that's what you need the defense. They definitely kept them. That's why I gave the defense an A. Like I felt like. They kept us in the game and let the offense kind of find a way to get some points. And I, I was I was really impressed with the off, uh, defense. Yeah, um, I also want to shout out a couple of guys. Quan Martin, uh, I thought made some big plays, a big pass breakup, the forced fumble. And Brett really today during a press conference um, said Jake Hansen played great. He, he's made a couple of plays the last couple of weeks that – uh, this defense needs. So uh, it seemed like the players responded to the the new positions that the coaching staff played them in. And Ryan said uh, earlier today, Jay, I mean, I think you hit it, that these players felt more comfortable. Like it was just a little simpler for them that they could just go make plays. Right. No, they, uh, it looked like that. Um, I mean, I think we're going to really miss Jake Hansen next year. I don't think we see all the stuff that he does. And we've kind of become, um, you know, Oh, it's Jake. He's going to make some plays. And we need more guys like Jake that you just count on to make plays, right? And so Hanson Sal, I still think he's an all Big Ten type linebacker. I know he hasn't had as many forced turnovers or whatever but this year, but he makes stuff happen. He's a very solid player for having, uh, you know, 
one of his starting defensive linemen's out, you know, and Keith Randolph, and he, he's played pretty well. So um, Quan Martin improved a lot. He was in, in the right position a lot more, and, and Spoon will take his chances, but uh, he's a physical, physical player. How much of this translates now to, to Purdue, Jay? Like how I think much- a lot. Yeah. I, I do. I, you know, we thought this would be a tough turnaround with going to Virginia and then playing in Maryland. And, um, you know, at the same time, you got to look at Maryland's at year four under Loxley. I guess maybe you could say it's year three if you don't count COVID. Um, they're probably expected to win that game. Uh, although we, we looked at it as a winnable game and it certainly was. I think Purdue is very similar to Maryland in the fact they want to throw the football. Like they want to throw the football for not just a hundred yards, but for three, 400 yards. And they've got guys. They probably don't have as many dudes as say, um, my wife just decided to print something off in the back. So there you go, guys. If you hear the printer noise in the back, that's what we do when we work from home. Um, but David Bells is better than any of those receivers we just saw. I think the trio of Demas J- uh, Jones and, 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 and Jarrett are probably better altogether. But David Bell's going to be better than all those guys. I think David Bell, in a way, is more dangerous than Rondell Moore. Rondell Moore is dangerous as a slot receiver, but David Bell can really go up and catch the balls in traffic uh, better than, than, than probably any receiver I know in the Big Ten. And so uh, you know that Brom is just a guy, he's going to want to outscore you. So if there's you know a minute left to go in the first, you know, first half, and they've only got one timeout from their own 20, they're going to try to score even if you do get the ball back, you know? Um, and so I do believe, though, that, that Purdue's been a, a team that's been hard for them to be consistent in winning. Um, and you're, I think this game will be close. I do. I don't, I don't think it's going to be a blowout. Uh, and I think the improvement in the defense is going to give them a lot of confidence. Yeah, and uh, David Bellhead is in the concussion protocol, so if, he, if he's oh. out, um, so that would be really interesting to see. All right, Jay, let's focus on the offensive side of the ball where, oh, boy, um, not much going well on that side. I mean, we got a couple running backs we need to talk about, so let's start with the positive there, shall we? Uh, both the guys left the game, but Brett Bielema said they're good to go this week. That's a very encouraging sign, uh, but Chase Brown for a second straight week, uh, it's just the best playmaker, it feels like, on that side of the ball. We talked about last week with the burst, and he's able to break tackles. He's gotten right. involved in the passing game. But, boy, Josh McCray, that does not look like a, a freshman out there, Jay. And he, even when he missed an assignment on a block, he, he slips out and gets a catch and goes for 40 yards. Um, it just They need that. They need guys to kind of come out of nowhere. Yeah. So, first off, I, I think it's one thing this offense is really struggled with is you know, their core, the center quarterback running back has, has not started, I don't think, a game altogether yep. other than, and they haven't because, you know, Peters has been out, Chase Brown's been out, Kramer was out for in the last game and a half. And th- that's a big detriment, okay? But let's talk about these running backs. I think in the open field, Chase Brown is the most explosive guy we got. We saw him make moves. Um, he hit. It's the line hard, sometimes to his own detriment. Almost he needs a little bit more patience in hitting the line, but I, I'm glad he's playing hard. And that's just his style. Mm-hmm. So I'll take it, right? And I think Chase Brown is probably our best back uh, overall. But I'll tell you what, and, and Bielma said that Josh McCray brings a certain energy. He does bring a certain energy to the game. Um, on that pass play and on that big run he had, I was impressed by his speed. Yeah. He pulled away from some guys. He, he's faster than I thought he was. Um, he runs angry. And I tell you what, if you can get him through the first line, you know, if you can get, get him without touched to the line of scrimmage, you know, get, get two or three yards past line of scrimmage without making him cut, I mean, he's going to get five or six because he's a load to bring down. What, what, what makes him difficult as a linebacker, Jay? I mean, you, I don't want to call him Monte Ball, but – that's what made ball was big, but he also had a little bit of burst, right? Like that's what seemed to make him. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's more like a John Clay. Okay. You know, uh, who, who really was, he's bigger, but he's got really soft feet for being a big guy. And so, you know, like a big guy, you're running through stuff, but he's able to move his feet good in the hole, which, you know, uh, for being a big guy, 
Uh, there's been a couple runs he takes direct hits. He doesn't take as many direct hits as a big guy would usually take. He's able to kind of shift at the last second. And he's got a nasty kind of natural stiff arm. Uh, in the open field, that guy's a lot more dangerous than you than you think he is because it's a business decision when you come down and you got a safety. You're like, man, do I, do I get a knee to the helmet or do I try to tackle him high and get a stiff arm? So – McCray's got, I, he's going to get more, he's going to get more carries. I guess I'm, I don't know what the injuries were. Obviously they took away Chase Brown's helmet. Uh, I know it looked like McCray fell, fell on something. I, and and so if you're, if you're injured, you're injured, I guess. It, I, I, and I think this is just me being an Illinois fan. I'm like, I just got to have a running back stay healthy. And like, I see, I see certain players. Uh, it seems like they have two good runs and they're tapping their helmet. Give me a blow to come out. I'm like, no, you should be wanting to get the ball, you know? And so, um, again, I'm not a medical person. I don't know. There's, there's more. Obviously, they're both injured enough, and they couldn't come back. If they could have come back, they would have come back. I'm just saying, I, I'm looking for – I love the depth of running back, but I'm looking for a running back that's like, I want eight, nine carries a drive. Feed me, right? And like That's what the Wisconsin guys do. I'm looking for that. And I, I haven't seen that yet. But I do think there could be a thunder and lightning aspect with Brown and McCray. Yeah, Peterson said those are his two backs now. Um, and I think we would all agree with that. Jakari Norwood could be a change of pace. Reggie Love, if you got to replace somebody. But um, and, and, and if you have any of those guys healthy in the fourth quarter, you probably win the game. Right. Absolutely. I, I think the game, you might have got third and two, right? And, and not had this fourth and one decision to have to make with Reggie Love in and Blake Gerasati as your center and – Julian Pearl's out. Like it was at that time, I know the fourth and one play was a big one. I was sitting there on the sideline, Jay, going, I don't know if I do this with, with the way the defense is playing with Blake Hayes. Blake Hayes didn't have the greatest well, with, punt. With obviously the, what defense the defense was playing up to that point. Right. It was the right decision. Now we, we hindsight's 2020. Right. Also, you can make the argument with a team like Maryland, that either are horrible drives or they score in a minute. So does it really matter? You know, because they can get those 30 yards back like that. Right. It's unfortunate that it's really unfortunate that I was at the 42 yard line. It just was the the hardest position to make. We know McCourt's good from 55, but that's a 59 yarder. Right. And if you miss it, they get the ball at the 42. Right. Um, or they well, someone was blocked earlier in the game, too. So you're like, oh shoot, like, well, we get we didn't become so you gotta look at it from the perspective. A coach has all these things, and he's trying to make the best decision based on what he's seen thus far. And I think that probably was the right decision to make. Uh, I know people want him to go for it. I think the hard thing was, too, I actually don't knock him for trying to win the game, you know, with a minute left, uh, right. with two minutes left. They, they, they just self-destructed. So mm-hmm. it looked really bad. Because they gave him a bunch, you know, get, Maryland got down to have a field goal like a minute left. And they just melted the clock for the last minute, you know? So it's tough. All right. Let's talk about quarterback, Jay, because I, I think obviously quarterback was still a problem, even though Brandon Peters was back in the game. I, I mean, he didn't get much protection. His wide receivers do not get separation, which is a big problem. Um, so I guess you could put this all together, Jay, if you want. How would you evaluate Brandon Peters in his return to the field? Um, so it's very hard to evaluate a player after he comes back after an injury, number one. Uh, so I don't know how much the injury affected him. I don't think Brandon Peters played up to his ability. And I think he would agree with that. Um, to win in the big 10, you've got to have a quarterback. You can rely on to have conversions. Okay. And whether it was the protection, uh, inaccurate throws, or just receivers not getting separated, the passing game wasn't where it was was or it's supposed to be. I mean, it's just, it's so concerning to me that I get super excited. Like when he finally connected with Isaiah Williams, I like think in the second quarter for like a big game, I was like, wow. And like, I just see other teams get chunk plays all the time in the past game. Right. And we just are not getting those. I will say the safety for um, Maryland, Nick Cross is a really, really good player. People don't realize how good Nick Cross is. And he had the tight end duty. He was all over Ford. He was all over Barker and really took our tight ends out of the game um they took out the flat route that had been so good uh, to the tight ends that was negated uh zook and the linebackers you know took out that play they knew that was an important play for the illinois offense and then 
we just don't seem to get much yak. I got to like Donnie Navarro. I got to have him stay on the stay, stay up on the ground, uh, stay up on his feet. Uh, we we got to get yards after the catch because yards are at a premium right now. Uh, and I don't know if Isaiah Williams got banged up or not, um, but sometimes he wasn't out there in critical situations. And yeah. I think we got to we got to find a way to get Isaiah Williams open more. Other than that, who else are we throwing to? I mean, there's not that many other options that we've seen. So um, to Brandon Peters, he definitely has a more live arm and is more mobile than Art Sikowski. He definitely slings it in there more than Art, but he did not play at the level we need him to play to be a to, to win. Yeah, and, and I, I want to be fair to him because it's obvious like he was not in good situations given the O-line, given the receivers. Right. And I thought, Maryland, you're right. Like, I, I thought Tony Peterson tried to get the ball to the tight ends, and Maryland was just all over it. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- there's also a factor of you still want your quarterback to elevate the team. And that's a lot of pressure on somebody. And it just feels like since that Nebraska game, Jay, he has not been able to do that. And you've talked, you've heard, you know, Tony Peterson and Brett Bielma came out today and said, he's our quarterback. He did some nice things. There's some things he wants back. We expect huge improvement because that was his week one to week two um, here against Purdue. So what are you looking for out of Brandon? Because it just, the offense with him lately and whether it's right to evaluate a COVID year where he had COVID and was out and injury early on, they're still putting him out there, right? And he's still struggling. So what do you need to see out of him? Because I'm just not seeing life out of the offense when he's been in the game lately. So n- number one, I, I, I think we've got to get Brandon Peters running more. I, it's surprising, but he seems to be the best when he runs. From what we've seen, over the last two or three years, he's a good runner. That was I mean, my frustration I, with Rod. I wanted Rod to run his offense with Brandon. Um, it seemed like instead he ran a completely different offense when Brandon was on the field. Right. So I know he's. I know he could get banged up. I think he needs to carry the ball five or ten times a game. Agreed. Okay. That's whether that's bootlegs, whether that's zone reads, what whatever that is, whether that's quarterback draws. I would run him five. Or, it seems to get him more comfortable. Number two is we've got to figure out a way uh, to get do span the ball more. I mean, I mean, the guy makes play and catches stuff, throw it his way. Do span and Isaiah Williams are our best playmakers. How do we get them the ball more with easy throws? How do we get the tight ends the ball more? I think they tried all those things. It wasn't available, but. One thing that I think is is with Chase Brown in the game and McCray, we saw the check down. And that shows you what Sikowski, we talked about this maybe two weeks ago. Sikowski never threw the running backs because he never got through his progression. So it shows you Peters can get through the progression and check it down. Or some of those were called plays. Like one of those was called to, um, you know, Chase Brown on that play, uh, which was a good, good dial up by Peterson. Um, but he tends to be able to go through his progressions more. I would get the running backs who seem to be our best players involved with screens and short throws early to get them going. Let Peters run the ball, then somehow do some scripted plays to get tight ends. Williams span the football. That's kind of the plan. But at the end of the day, after you get going, we got to be able to throw the football down the field. And he tried the first like, second play of the game, but double coverage probably wasn't a good throw. Yeah, I thought Daniel Barker was open on a wheel route, or at least in one-on-one coverage um, where where he had a chance there. Um, You brought it up. Like, I saw Bronco Mendenhall get the ball to Thompson, that KT on Thompson, in such creative ways. And and Isaiah Williams, like, he needs the ball more than two times. I know he was targeted seven times, but he's kind of been targeted like a, a traditional wide receiver, and he's just not that quite yet, right? So. What do you what have you thought of Tony Peterson's offense through four games and knowing he's limited with what he's got, knowing the injuries have really impacted him with Kramer and Brandon Peters? Um, what have your thoughts been on, on Tony Peterson so far? Um, uh, first of all, I think he's a good play caller. I think he's schemed up some stuff that has gotten him some points. Um, number two, 
this is an offense that's not built to come from behind. Right. And so we've seen him calling plays largely from behind, not this game, but largely it was, and um, that's been difficult. I do think he needs to get, and I said in the broadcast, players, not plays. We need to get to the very few players that we have, even if it's just a little short, you know, reverse pass handoff to Williams like they did with Demas. We need to run that play one or two times a game. Um, we've got to get Chase Brown the ball more, right? So we got to get, we just, what's hard for an offense like Peterson is, uh, with, with Tony Peterson is there's no place to get chunk plays. So you are always in this, how do I get three or four yards? How do I, and it seems very vanilla, but at the same time, I mean, you felt it. It's like, could the clock run fast enough in the fourth quarter? No, no, it couldn't, right? And we just don't have that of a super imposing interior line right now, and offensive line. So it's hard to impose your will. And when you're having trouble and your backs are out and your quarterback's not doing great, what do you do in the fourth quarter? So he's had a lot of different things that have thrown his way. I still think he's a good hire. I think they're still kind of getting in a rhythm of what they want to be offensively. Um, and we haven't necessarily seen that all together. Yeah. So it sounds like they're getting a little healthy, Jay. They get Kramer back. They're hoping to get Keith Randolph back. Brandon Peters game two. Um, how hopeful are you against Purdue? Because I, Purdue's got a couple of dudes. Like if David Bell is healthy, he's one of the best receivers in the Big Ten. George Karloftis, defensive lineman, is going to be a, a first-round pick. I, the, my thing with Purdue the last couple of years is they're, they got dudes, but they don't have a lot of depth, um, it feels right. like. So I thought this was a very winnable road game uh, coming on the schedule. Given what we saw from the defense, given that the offense is starting to get healthy, what do you think of the possibilities with this game? Well, it's well documented that their offensive line has always struggled at Purdue. It's never been a dominant offensive line. They basically just scheme to protect the quarterback. And so I believe this is a very bit winnable game for Illinois, um, especially if weather becomes a factor, as we saw two years ago. You know, that, that's when Illinois dominated in, in the rainstorm. Now, we, we can't expect another rainstorm like that. But I think Illinois has a great chance to win. Um, but they're going to have to have better play out of their quarterback. And the defense is going to have to keep them in the game as you know, better, but um, as much as they did in the Maryland game, which they did keep them in the game. I think we'll see similar stuff um, that Brian Walters will do as far as dropping eight. I think that worked well. I think he'll mix it up some because Brom now has that on tape and we haven't seen that before. But I'm not super, like, I would say there's some dudes, there's some players that Purdue has. But as far as across the board, I'm not super impressed by their starting defense or their starting offense. Um, I think schematically, Brom's going to test it in the passing game, and we've got to be ready. Uh, I think going into this game last week, I would have been a lot more nervous, but I saw some improvement for Illinois, and I, I think this would be a close football game. I really do. Is the Big Ten good, Jay? Um, you know, Ohio State, I know, isn't maybe as – uh impervious as they were in previous years but we know they're still the favorite Iowa and Penn State are top six right now Michigan looks like it's back uh Michigan State looks like it's back what have you thought of the Big Ten overall I think it's just better for the conference honestly we, we've been I mean Ohio State has really been I mean they've always been good they've been on an unprecedented run the last five years I, I with their quarterbacks I mean I, this is this is a school at one time um you know, had JT Barrett, the all-time all offensive leader in the Big Ten, and then had Dwayne Haskins behind him, first round pick, and had Joe Burrow, who never saw the light of day, to play in Ohio Stadium. Uh, so he transferred to LSU, and now, you know, Burrow's starting, and Haskins is, and JT's not even in the NFL. And then you had Justin Fields come in right after Haskins. So I, I won't get into it, but it's good for the conference that it's just not all about Ohio State, yeah. okay? Um I think that Penn State was down a little bit the last two years. I don't see that as well. I see that now. I think they're a good football team. Um, uh, I think they're a top 10 team. I don't think they're a national championship team. Uh, I think you really got to watch out for the Hawkeyes. The, the, their schedule, who they've already beaten. Uh, this is a team that could sneak into the playoff this year. Um, I also think Michigan's better, but – I, I think they're a 10-win team. I don't think they're a 
12 win team. Uh, and it's good to have Michigan State back. You know, it, I think it's discouraging to Illinois fans when you see, you know, a guy come in in the second year, really is, you know, first full year and turn around the program really quick, right? I, I think Northwestern, it, it looks to be uh, a down year right now because uh, when they have had a quarterback, they've been really good. I don't know if, if, if Hunter Johnson has played up to their expectations right now. And uh, they're also shifting out of Mike Hankwitz as a defensive coordinator who retired. And Mike Hankwitz was a great defensive coordinator and they had great defense in the last 10 years. And I think they're still adjusting that. Now, Northwestern has been a team that usually gets better throughout the year. Uh, I think Minnesota won, what, by 30 or something like to Colorado. So they're solid. And, and Wisconsin's always going to be solid. Mm -hmm. um, so do I think across the board, I think the Big Ten's healthier. You know, for a while there, it was just Ohio State. And then it was like the big three of Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State. I, I think we're healthier across the board than we have been. Uh, we saw that in some of the non-con matchups, whether it's Colorado, Minnesota, whether it's Nebraska, Oklahoma, which is closer than everybody thought, Auburn, Penn State, Iowa State, Iowa. Of course, Oregon, or, uh, Oregon, Ohio State didn't work out well. And uh, we, Washington, Michigan, that, you know, Washington's not very good. But I think we're seeing, hey, there's some balance across the board. Good stuff, Jay Lehman. Uh, always uh, great to catch up with you every Monday, man. And uh, we'll catch up with you next week. Yeah, buddy.